I first met you back in, it would have been 1972, I think. And at that time, you were influencing the worship life of North America through your worship workbench publication by Campus Ministry Communications in Chicago. And in your time in Waterloo, you, you influenced, I would say, a generation of pastors who 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 worked uh, who attended Waterloo Lutheran Seminary at that time, when you were either the campus pastor worshiping in Keffer Chapel, or you were the worship professor and the professor of right. spirituality at the seminary. It's been a great ride for me. I really have enjoyed it. Hi. I'm Karen Kuhnert. I'm in this conversation today because I was a campus ministry intern in Lutheran Campus Ministry in Waterloo. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Hi, I'm Stephen Larson, and I'm in this conversation today because I was a campus pastor at the University of Alberta in Edmonton for 11 years. And I was raised in a Lutheran student center for a couple of years on the campus of Oregon State University in Oregon. My name is Ken Kuhn, Pastor Ken Kuhn. I was campus pastor in the 70s at the University of Alberta. And also during that time, I was engaged in studies in sociology. So I think my tension has been uh, to see how the gospel expresses itself uh, within a scientific kind of milieu. So I appreciate that uh, Paul has contributed um, to this conversation as well. My name is Paul Bosch, and I'm grateful for the chance to tell about my time in campus ministry. It was just wonderful. Thank you for allowing me to do this. I, I really appreciate it. Paul, thank you so much for agreeing to share your story of campus ministry on both sides of the North American border. I want to start by asking you about your own experience as a student in university and seminary and ask what were your first encounters with campus ministry or the Lutheran Student Association of America? Wow, big package. I suppose Seminary made a big difference to me. I had some wonderful teachers, uh, Martin Heineken, whom you may know, uh, Ted Tappert, whom you may know, uh, Edmund Steinle, whom you may know, uh, some, some very good teachers. Uh, I must say, I learned more. I was shaped more by campus ministry, however, five years after I was ordained. Uh, I was ordained in 1956 and went to uh, St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I knew the pastor there and we got on famously. We had a wonderful time together. But four years later, I was called to Syracuse and that was just a wonderful experience. Every summer in Syracuse and across the country on both sides of the border, in those days, there was no division between Canadian and uh, American campus ministries. Uh, on both sides of the border, there were some really wonderful people. And in 1960, that's when I came 
to Syracuse University. In 1960, they had two conferences, one uh, in, I think it was Minneapolis, and that's called a staff conference. And that was included uh, professionals in campus ministry. Some of them ordained, some of them unordained. One of the unordained campus ministers was Kathy Steiner, and she became my wife. That was just a wonderful experience. Uh, I met here Henry Horn. I met Gil Doan. I met Ken Larson. I met some marvelous people who really changed me. Uh, I Maybe it was in... <laughs> in my genes or something. Uh, I have a father who was a minister and uncles who were ministers and five generations of Lutheran ministers on my mother's side, going back to uh, the <laughs> uh, Revolutionary War. Uh, you, you, when you're brought up in that kind of a situation, you always consider the ministry as a possibility, but nobody pushed me. Ne neither of my parents pushed me into any kind of ministry. Uh, anyhow, I came uh, to meet these people and they shaped me. They made me who I was. Furthermore, the beginning of the 60s is the time when you had Martin Luther King, you had the women's movement, you had the peace movement, you had gay liberation. I mean, it was such an exciting time, particularly an exciting time to be on the campus. And you had the Second Vatican Council in Roman Catholicism, which had the promise of turning Rome inside out. You know, I think if we'd had different popes following uh, John the 23rd, uh, we'd already have women priests and married priests and so on. But uh, John Paul was very conservative. And of course, Benedict, these are popes now, uh, they were very conservative and they put in a lot of bishops who were very conservative and uh, they were not friends of the Second Vatican Council. Anyhow, that was just a very exciting time. I walked with Martin Luther King, not for civil rights, but to uh, protest the Vietnam War. Uh, and that was, you know, that shapes you when you, when you walk with, uh, uh, in a situation like that. So, what can I say? I was almost 20 years at Syracuse University. And uh, all during that time, I had as the model for my ministry, what I got from Henry Horn. Namely, I am to be a parish pastor whose parish happens to be a campus. And the whole idea of that was new to me and it made sense to me and I followed that. Uh, I, I'm happy to say that uh, my successors in Syracuse and in Amherst and in Waterloo have endorsed that model of campus ministry as well. And uh, here in Waterloo, the Lutheran Seminary has validated that, you might say. Anyhow, that's the beginning. That is wonderful. Uh, you've mentioned some of the highlights in your Syracuse years. What were some of the challenges that you were surprised at in those years at Syracuse? Yeah, what was I surprised at? I took a sabbatical in uh, when would it have been 68 and 69. I had little kids, uh, two lovely girls, uh, seven and four, and we went to Europe for a year, courtesy of the Danforth Foundation. 
Danforth Foundation is the money behind Purina Dog Chow. And they had a competition every year in campus ministry. And I won the competition in 68, 69. And that gave me, would you believe, $7,000. And that was sufficient to take me to Europe. And uh, we applied, my wife at that time was teaching in the school of uh, what did they call it? Human development in those days. It used to be home economics, but they they changed the title of it. Anyhow, uh, my wife went to say, "Hey, can we uh, get uh, passage on uh, a boat, uh, a ship that will take us to Europe uh, and uh, be the chaplains for?" a group of 16 young women who were going to the Syracuse University program in Amsterdam, Holland. And their answer was, we don't want you, we want your husband. <laughs> I mean, they, they knew something about me and they, they hired both of us to be chaplains for this 10 day crossing. It took 10 days to get across the ocean, it was wonderful. And these kids took my children, my seven and four-year-old, as mascots. And uh, we had a very, very happy time. Uh, I suppose that changed me. Uh, I went to the Ecumenical Institute of the World Council of Churches outside Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, I studied with... Um, what's his name, Hans Rudy Weber, and Joseph Weber, and Anwar Barkat, and J.A.T. Robinson even. And uh, he was a visiting scholar for one week, I think it was, but boy, he was terrific. And so he would be one of the people who shaped me. He wrote a book called Liturgy Coming to Life. And boy, oh, it was wonderful. I recommend it to anybody. Henry Horn set me onto the book. And when we had the chance to sit down at the feet of uh, John Robinson, why that was lots of fun. It, the, the time in, in Bossy was wonderful. And after that, that was so uh, what, seven months, something like that. In March or April then I went to uh, Leeds in Northern England and I was parish pastor temporarily for a little English Norwegian congregation where the, in most cases, the man was uh, a, a refugee during the war and they were raising English families, but they thought of themselves as Lutherans. And worship became very important to me. And uh, I think you can say, what could you say? Well, you know, that I became a model for uh, good worship practice throughout the Synod and throughout the National Church. I was the first person to wear alb and stole and chasuble at a Synod national uh, or a, a Synod yearly conve convention and the first person to wear alb and stole and chasuble at a national. I first met you back in, it would have been 1972, I think. And at that time, you were influencing the worship life of North America through your worship workbench publication by Campus Ministry Communications in Chicago. And in your time in Waterloo, you you influenced, I would say, a generation of pastors who 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 worked uh, who attended Waterloo Lutheran Seminary at that time, when you were either the campus pastor worshiping in Keffer Chapel, or you were the worship professor and the professor of sure. spirituality at the seminary. You have had a very influential 
uh, ministry. For 30 years now, I've been writing an essay on worship every month, sometimes a couple of months, a couple of essays per month uh, on the worship website. The worship website is worship.ca. Look us up. We're good. It's the best worship website on the internet. <laughs> I mean, it gives hymns for every day. It gives prayers for every day. It gives my essays, which go under the name Worship Workbench. And it's, it, it, it's, a good, it's a good website, and I very much enjoy cranking out these uh, essays once a month. It keeps me alive. I tell people, it keeps me out of the pool halls. <laughs> the model of campus ministry as a parish ministry on campus, that, that model persists to this day. And uh, there were other possibilities. You know, you could be a counselor or think of yourself chief, chiefly as a counselor. Now, a parish pastor does counseling, but the parish pastor does not think of uh, himself or herself as chiefly a counselor. That's just part of the work of the left hand, so to speak. You can think of yourself as a community organizer. You could think of yourself as an administrator. You could think of yourself as a teacher. A lot of campus ministries in those days thought that they were chiefly teachers, so they had non-credit courses throughout the year. And if you were really good at it, uh, you became a faculty member at the, uh, at the school you were serving. Uh, and of course, parish pastors do all of those things, organize the community and teach and counsel and anyhow. Uh, the Danforth Foundation, the foundation that sent me to Europe, they made a study in the late 60s, early 70s in campus ministry, and they concluded that what a parish, what a campus pastor ought to be is a resource broker. That is to say, you were to bring together representatives of the campus and representatives of the town, and you were to solve societal problems. And that's one of the things that parish pastors on a campus do, but it's not the main thing. I thought that was a foolish, <laughs> a foolish conclusion to their studies. And I must say that most of those kinds of ministries have now disappeared. My understanding is that the parish pastor model of campus ministry endures. It stays with us. And uh, as I say, the people who followed me at Syracuse and in Amherst and in Waterloo all endorse that view. Paul, from, from Syracuse, you went to Amherst. What were those years like Amherst, uh, right. serving five, I think five different university campuses you were um, uh, it, related it to? A huge package. It included the so-called five colleges, University of Massachusetts, Amherst College, Smith College, Mount Holyoke College, and Ham, 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 Hampshire College, anyhow, plus an established parish with a building and committees and so on. And what happened is I soon found myself tied up in the business of the resident parish and not doing campus ministry. So we hired a young man to be a campus minister to those campuses. But that's the job I wanted. <laughs>
I was chaplain at WLU and UW, what, Wilfrid Laurier University and the University of Waterloo. It happens that the very, uh, what would I say, the grandmother institution is the seminary. That began, uh, you know, 100 years ago. And that gave, the, the, the seminary then began uh, to establish a university along with it. And that was Waterloo Lutheran University. Then it became Wilfrid Laurier University. And there was a split off from the science faculty that became University of Waterloo. So that's the grandchild. The grandmother is Waterloo Lutheran Seminary. The daughter is Wilfrid Laurier University. And the grandchild is University of Waterloo. And it worked very nicely. They, I had a nice office in the, I should say I was part of a team and the team had the office in both places. Uh, one day a week, I was at University of Waterloo. Another day a week, I was at, a, at a Wilfrid Laurier University. And in both cases, I had a lovely office that I was sharing with uh, the Presbyterian and the Methodists and so on. And we had some wonderful guests there. Boy, we had Henry Nowen. And I had lunch with Henry Nowen. We had uh, Philip and... Uh, uh, what's the other guy's name? Bear, the, the Berrigan brothers. Daniel and Philip. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, they were Daniel and Philip. They were both our guests, and I had lunch with them. Martin Luther King uh, came to campus, and we had lunch with him. It, it, that was a wonderful experience. And uh, the uh, seminary was very grateful, uh, very gracious in allowing me to use the space in Keffer Chapel as the worship space. And we had worship there on Sunday morning and we had worship there on Wednesday night. When we came to town, we bought 157 Albert, this big, beautiful old Victorian home right across from the seminary. And I think the very first year we also had Fred and Debbie Lou Ludolf live with us in our home. They had just been married and they had moved from Saskatoon to Waterloo and didn't have a place to live. And they lived with us for a year. Uh, the conversation around the table in the evening, uh, the dinner table, uh, that conversation was so great. I hated, I hated to go out to an evening meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to miss anything. Uh, yeah, all, almost all through Syracuse days and in, in a sense too in Amherst days, uh, Paul and Kathy Bosch had other students who actually lived with us in our home. Hmm. And I, I think that was a good thing. Uh, and of course, having the student house three doors away uh, with eight students there, that was a good thing too. So you, you cannot discount that, uh, what will I say? Well, uh, you know, it, it's part of the geographical parish. In 1960, I was the editor of Frontiers Magazine, the magazine of the Lutheran Student Association. Uh -huh. And Henry Horn wrote an article in the volume that I edited um, called The Whole Course, The Whole Course. And the article was part of an emphasis um, from the 
World Student Christian Federation. Oh, world and Sacrament. Oh, wonderful. Word, World, and Sacrament was the emphasis. Yeah. So my question is, how did you find liturgy as an expression which brought together the various disciplines within the university. How did you manage your worship services in a liturgy that acknowledged the arts, the sciences, and philosophy and all the rest? Wow, that's a big package. Word, world, and sacrament if I recall correctly, was a title of a very early, uh, actually, a, they finally published it as a book. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, it was a, uh, uh, they were, I think, three or four speeches at a student conference shortly after I became campus ministry, uh, minister. It was like, but 1962 or 63, something like that. And the, the author was William Klebsch, C-L-E-B-S-C-H, an Anglican priest who, again, turned my perceptions upside down. He was terrific. Uh, this was the summer that uh, Marilyn Monroe died. And he said, Marilyn Monroe did not commit suicide. He said, what happened was a nice little girl from Ohio by the name of Norma Jean Baker was murdered by Marilyn Monroe. And he used that as a metaphor with religion and faith. And he said, faith is always at the point of being murdered. <laughs> by its religious expression. <laughs> and ain't it a shame? Does it have to be that way? I would say religion, quote unquote, <laughs> there are four things that make up religion. Creed, code, cult, and constitution. Creed, that's your belief, your doctrines, your dogmas, your value system. What is it that you value? Code, that's your code of conduct, your ethical system, the way you put what you believe to action. Three, cult. That's a word from religious studies, and it means how you ritualize all of and even constitution, how do you give it political shape? Do you have bishops? Do you have presidents? Uh, I, I say only, only partly in jest that uh, Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there you will find me. And there you will also find a president, a secretary, and a treasurer. <laughs> I mean, that... That's simply the way humans arrange themselves. <laughs> now, creed, code, cult, and constitution, each one of those four things can murder faith. And that's terrible. It does not have to be that way. <laughs> and uh, I, I think our job as pastors is to see to it that it doesn't happen that our creed, our value system, is transparent to faith, that our ethics is transparent to faith, that our cult, our, uh, our rituals, our ceremonies, they are transparent to faith, even our political system. As you think about the future of campus ministry in this era of... Um what, post-Christendom in North America and the cutback of funding for campus ministries. What do you see as the future mission of our church on the university campuses in Canada? 
Yeah, that that's a tough one. Uh, you're certainly correct that we're living now in a post-Christendom era. Uh, I would never call it a post-Christian era. Uh, there, there'll always be Christianity, but uh, but. I describe it in terms of Palm Sunday and <laughs> Good Friday. Where when I began in 1960, it was the Palm Sunday of the church. Hosanna, lots of people, lots of money, uh, a new church building at every suburban intersection. I mean, those days are gone. And I'm not going to shed a great deal uh, you know, I'm not going to shed a lot of tears. Uh, it meant 1,700 years of the Christian church being in bed with the emperor. Constantine in 325 or whatever, he made uh, the Christian church not, well, it, it was he who, uh, the Edict of Toleration, the church was tolerated for the first time. Up until then, Christians are burned at the stake and fed to the lions. And, you know, Christians were ha had a real tough time back in those days until Constantine comes along and he makes Christianity legal and uh, tolerated. I think it's the next uh, emperor who actually makes it the official religion of the emperor, emperor empire. <laughs> Anyhow, that put the church in bed with the emperor. And whatever the emperor did, the church endorsed it. And that, that was very unfortunate, I, th I think. Uh, at the same time, we've got Augustine, who's one of my heroes, uh, coming up with the five standards for a just war, for instance. A just war should be legally declared. It shouldn't be just a vigilante operation. It should be winnable. You should be able to win the war. Uh, what's the third thing? Uh, uh, discrimination and uh, proportion. Uh, discrimination means you should not be involving uh, civilian populations. And proportion, you should not make, uh, the, the war should not cause more uh, disruption of life than if you didn't have the war. Uh, they're good standards. And I think Augustine was kind of pulling one over on the emperor in that he expected most of the Christians to be, so to speak, conscientious objectors. Up until that time, almost every Christian was a conscientious objector. But then we're in bed with the emperor, we do what the emperor says. And most mainline churches, including the Lutheran church, have never seen a war they don't like. <laughs> I mean, that's speaking very uh, broadly. But, uh, well, I, I should say there was one example, and that is uh, Jean Chrétien, the prime minister of uh, Canada. When George W. Bush invaded Iraq, John Creighton said, Canada is not going to go along with this. And George W. Bush put terrific pressure on John Creighton. Hey, be part of the coalition of the willing. And one of the things that John Creighton said was, my churches do not like the idea of going to war with Iraq. You break it, you own it. Anyhow, uh, that was one example where uh, the churches did make a big difference. All of the mainline churches decided 
<laughs> they jump out of bed uh, with the emperor and confront the emperor. And they did that uh, over the Iraq war. And I think everybody today would agree that the Iraq war was just a terrible mistake. Uh, anyhow, it gives us some freedom now that we are in what, since 1960, 1970, we are in a kind of a post-Christian era, post-Christendom era. And we are free, we're kind of at the margins of things. And we're free to criticize the emperor. And we're free to say, no, we're not gonna do this. And I think that's good. I think that's part of our future. Uh, it does mean that we don't have the money we used to have. Uh, we don't have the people we used to have. My congregation is all gray hairs. We, we, we've got an apologetic job to do. That is to say, we have to give an account of the hope that is in us. Christians have to give an account of the hope that is in us. That's First Peter in the Bible. Uh, and I don't think we're very good at that. Uh, we've, we, we've talked to our own people, the people that, well, the gray hairs. But we're not very good at attracting new people. We're not very good at adult baptism. Uh, you know, the Lutheran Book of Worship came out, uh, when was it, 20 years ago, more than that. Uh, 40. 24 years ago? 40, 40, 40 years, years ago. 40. It was LBW, 1978. Yeah. Anyhow, that came out with a, 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 a terrific uh, new emphasis on baptism. But now that's lost. Could you say a little bit, if you would, about what it was like in the Canadian church in that time of transition from national funding to synodical funding to congregational funding? There was a lot of changes there. Whatever you can say. Yeah. Uh... In some ways, back when it happened, I, I was negative about the Canadian church splitting from the American church. I thought the American church had an awful lot to give us, more than we were willing or able to give to the American church. So way back when ELCIC was formed, I, as I say, I was kind of negative to the cries for, hey, let's have our own Canadian church. Now, I voted for the split. Aware, as I was at the time, and I think I still am, that the prairies and the Western church simply would not <laughs> any longer tolerate uh, a, a cross-border church, that they were determined to be a separate ecclesiastical body. So I voted with them and I voted for the establishment of the ELCIC. And it hasn't turned out too badly. <laughs> uh, I still think the American church has a lot to give the uh, Canadian church, and we got something to give them as well. You came in 82, and before you came Oz in the 70s, and Rub Tigan, but then came Dick Crossman, Bob and Nelly, Nancy Kelly, and so the seminary really was populated by more American theologians than Canadian born 
theologians. It was an American seminary on Canadian soil mm. in some senses. Thinking back, because you are a cross-border person, how did that feel to be so many Americans watching the Canadian transition? Yeah, I, as I say, I moved to Canada in 82. And shortly after, I became a dual citizen. So I'm a citizen of USA and of Canada. That means I vote in both places and I pay taxes in both places. And the largest part of my retirement income, if it's worth anything to you, uh, the largest part of my retirement income comes from the States. Uh, my, the, my pension from the ELCA and the American Social Security. That's both, both of those together are the biggest part of my retirement income. And I also get retirement income from the ELCIC, my church, and social insurance from Canada. So I, I have those four sources of Canadian uh, 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 in, in my living in Canada. I must say, during the four years of Donald I was very, very glad to be a Canadian. Uh, my daughters are, to this day, are very, very glad that I'm a Canadian. The health system, I mean, uh, I had open heart surgery in 2001 and I didn't pay a penny. I paid for the telephone at my bedside. Now, I also had open heart surgery in the USA in 1973. It could have wiped me out. You know, it could have bankrupted me. It didn't, but, but it could have. I mean, it, I had to pay a lot of money. But I didn't have to pay a penny living in Canada. And uh, the Canadian system is pretty good. And the Canadian church is pretty good. <laughs> I must say, I, uh, you know, I, uh, people like Oz, Oz Cole Arnell, and uh, who, uh, who else could you name? Well, you can name a lot of people, but boy, they, they're my mentors as well. And I've told them that. Uh, Harold Remus, Andre Laverne, uh, th these people, James Brown, James Brown was my parish pastor for uh, what, how many years? 20 years. Anyhow, you know, he's just a terrific guy. And uh, it, it, those Canadians stack up against any American. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a full enough answer for you, but. <laughs> the model for campus ministry in those foundational years was a student center that was a home away from home. But I'm thinking that in your time and perhaps under your influence, the model for campus ministry has changed to focus on worship, liturgical worship. And I know that, and I know that Steve, who succeeded me, um, although retaining the campus center, um, also had a more active um, emphasis upon uh, liturgical worship. You, you mentioned the, the pastor's home. Yes. I, I am very much uh, I'm very much a champion of the geographical parish. I grew up in a parsonage right next to the church. My mother hated it, <laughs> but I loved it. And my dad, I think, loved it. And there's something to be said 
for the hospitality of a parish pastor's family using their home as a place where students and others can come. And, you know, we've always, my wife, any of you know Kathy? Steve, did you know Kathy pretty well or a little bit? Sure. How about you, Karen? Was she still alive? No, she had passed. She had she she had passed. But but she was a wonderful host. And every Friday night, I think in every parish that I've been in, uh, uh, including uh, Syracuse and Amherst and uh, Waterloo, our home would be open on Friday night and kids would come and hang out. It had no program. We just hang out and listen to records and talk and that is so important. And I think having lost, we should not lose the idea of a geographical parish. (laughs) So Paul, your influence of the worship life of the church was recognized by your receiving the award Companion of the Worship Arts at a national worship conference. Can you tell us a bit about that, that award? Sure. Um, I was still, I think, chaplain when uh, Andre Laverne, you may know that name, uh, another young pastor, I got 30 years on him, I think. Uh, I, that is, I'm 30 years older than he is. I'm 90. I think he's 60, whatever. Anyhow, uh, he and I became friends. He was part of the committee that called me to Waterloo. And uh, he, he and I have become friends. And it was he who invented a national worship conference uh, every two years. And uh, it brought together people from all over the, the, what was it, five synods in those days at a location and a four-day program of some very fine speakers. And it ended with a banquet and the awarding of Companion of the Worship Arts. And uh, I was the first awardee or the honoree. Uh, It was Andre again who invented that idea. And that has continued all these years, it's at least 20 years old, uh, every two years, and Anglicans are part of it now. So we, uh, at the banquet, uh, we Lutherans award a person as companion of the worship arts, and the Anglicans do the same thing. They're also with us at the banquet, and they award a person as a companion of the worship arts. So that's that's meant a great deal to me, partly because of the writing I've done through the years for this worship website, I think, but uh, maybe just my, (laughs) maybe my smile. I think the conversation uh, that you've contributed to as well been a very, very uh, worthwhile one. Amen. <laughs> Th- thank you, Paul, so much for your storytelling and your reflections and your experience. But, but above all, thank you for your ministry over the years in person and through your writings. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm awfully glad that we were able to find each other this morning on short notice. So delighted, Paul, that at 90, you have the verve that you have had the whole time I've known you. It is a pleasure to follow after you and in your footsteps to be raised up by you over these last two decades, to have you raise up my family, both my husband and our children, uh, and uh, be a blessing. I want to thank you, Paul. 